Welcome to planet Earth, the home of multiple biomes and life forms. Today, we will be focusing on a biome called the deciduous forest. This right here is a deciduous forest, abundantly filled with tall trees that shade the forest floor and home to many creatures and plants alike. We will join scientists to learn more. Along the globe exists a band that defines a certain temperature where a deciduous forest can grow. These temperatures may be around 70 degrees in winter, normally going below freezing, and it can be found in the eastern half of the United States and Canada, as well as across the ocean in Europe, Russia, China, and Japan. It can also exist in the northern hemisphere. Although these locations may be different, they all have the same deciduous forest qualities. So while these locations may be in different parts of the globe, they still have these deciduous forest qualities with the same predators and preys being shown and given, such as a apex predator and uh, similar producers. They create a biome that can withstand this temperature and create a common forest scene across the world. I did not see you there. I was just busy admiring the beauty of this wonderful biome, the deciduous forest. The deciduous forest is filled to the brim with multiple species, insects, and plants that we will be talking about throughout this documentary. Now let's explore this forest and see these wonderful species and take a walk on the wild side. Hello viewers. By this point of time in this documentary, you might be wondering what a deciduous forest even is. We haven't got to explain that yet. Well, let me explain it with some vocabulary. The word deciduous translates to falling off, which directly refers to the leaves falling off during the autumn season and winter season. Dr. Clank, can you please explain this tree that we are sitting in right now? Hey, what's up guys? So right now, we're sitting in Aquarius, also known as an oak tree, which is a part of the beech family. The oak tree acts as a producer in this great forest, and many animals can live in it as well, because of its branches that can grow out to be 135 feet. It produces um, acorns, which are a great food for squirrels and other animals too, and um, can grow up to 70 feet, can you believe that? With a base of nine feet as well. Truly amazing. This particular oak tree is home to the gray squirrel who collects food and stores it before winter comes. Scientists define the gray squirrel as Sicarius carolinius. The squirrel is also heterotroph in this biome and will store acorns for winter. It is mainly a scavenger who will eat nuts, berries, and other dead species. On occasion, the gray squirrel will hunt for smaller animals to bring home to its nest that is made of twigs and sticks. Lined with grass and bark as for its physical features, the gray squirrel has a bushy tail bordered in white fur. Lastly, its mating season takes place in late winter and their litters consist of two to three kits. A pesky problem may arise for the gray squirrel. This pesky problem are termites. They tend to build their house in dying trees with the chance of decomposers moving in. In most instances, this decomposer is a termite, or a small insect that eats wood. The termite is similar to the ant in that it moves in colonies and has a queen. Moreover, the termite doesn't only eat wood, it'll eat a variety of plants and decaying animals. In the termite colony, the hierarchy exists, descending from queen all the way to soldier. Dr. Clank, don't you find it very interesting what the squirrels are doing? Collecting food all just for the winter? Well, yes, but personally, I like the bald eagle more. Why is that? Well, the bald eagle is one of the most fascinating animals in this area. And also, it's the um, country's bird okay, animal. Okay, Dr. Clank, if you find the bald eagle so interesting, why don't you tell us a bit about it? Well, it's the far- Whoa! Ah, a bald eagle right there! Whoa! There's a bald eagle! Well, the bald eagle is defined as 
a, a grand animal that lives uniquely in North America. Its diet consists of rodents, snakes, fish, mammals. It will also attempt to, <laughs> to steal food from other birds, those sly devils. The distinct physical characteristics include large heads. And also, the bald eagles in its juvenile state have brownish and sometimes black <laughs> feathers on the tail and wings instead hmm. of the bold white. All right, you got me there. That is very fascinating, Dr. Clank. I now fully understand why the bald eagle is our nation's species. Yes. <laughs> Welcome back. We'll be joining our naturalist shortly, but for right now, I'm going to explain a few species you might encounter in this amazing biome. First up, this is the lady fern. The lady fern, as atherium, is a fern that acts as a producer to the biome. It is a J-shaped casing, also known as a sori. This grows on the underside of the leaf. The fern prefers to grow in moist, shady areas um, and it is eaten by many species such as elk, bear, and it is also a very large tree, um, but it only grows up to five feet in height. So the next plant we will be talking about is the Canadian maple leaf tree. The maple leaf tree is a staple to all our Canadian viewers. That's right, we see you guys. The maple tree, also known as the Acer, possesses a beautiful fall colored leaf. Uh, this grows opposite to one another, um, and by that I mean the, the, the leaf itself grows opposite to one another upon the branch. Uh, the leaf can grow very large, up to five inches, that's sometimes larger than people's faces. Um, the, they have a few shallow lobes going on them, and they're serrated with teeth. The maple acts as a great producer for both humans and animals in this biome. The final plant we will be talking about and taking a look at today is actually a fungus, um, also known as the Amanita caesara, an edible mushroom that will bloom from autumn to early summer. The mushroom acts as a decomposer, living off dead trees and helping to break down animals. It has a large red-orange cap and a palish gold gill. This beautiful mushroom that tastes delicious as well is just a wonderful treat for both humans and animals alike in this forest. Welcome back. Me and Dr. Clink have been finding samples that could be useful in our research in the lab while also investigating the local insects of the area. If you don't, Micah, underneath all these leaves is the earthworm, also known as the lumbricana. The lumbricana eats numerous things like decomposing animals, plants, and dirt. It then defecates these things into nutrients for the plants. Some, some description, the description of the lumbricana is it has, it's made up of small segmented ridges and um, mini miniature hairs on all the ridges so it can sense things as well. Also, it has organs for either light sensing or it can, um, it can um, sense like chemical changes in the environment so that it could navigate. That is very interesting, Dr. Clank. I couldn't seem to find any just now. Ah, sure. Doctors, doctors, look what I found. Can you examine it for me? Ah, oh, sure, Tim Tim. <laughs> this is a spotted salamander, also known as the Uridella. It is a carnivore and they usually have slender bodies, short legs, and a long tail. And they're covered with yellow spots all over their body. Their skin has a slimy exterior and have an overall flat, slender shape. A weird behavioral habit is that they walk in a side-to-side -side motion. The salamander can also communicate using touch and chemicals, but remember to be careful around them. They have a protein toxin. They use this toxin to attack predators and hunt prey, and the salamander will eat anything that moves. Oh, that's really cool. I'm gonna go put it back where I found it to make sure I don't get hit with the toxins. Okay, bye, Tim Tim. Be safe, we'll meet you back at the lab. While they make their way back to the lab, let me tell you about the coyote, a shy carnivore that has a pointed nose, gray to reddish fur, and a thick, long, bushy tail. The coyote also has a profound sense of smell and eyesight, 
and will use these advantages to hunt for small game, eating whatever meat it can kill. Also, the coyote will roam in packs and are possibly one of the most clever species in the forest. Hey there, come on in. I assume you've brought the photos with you. Yes, we do. Go. Sir, here are the photos that we have collected. Wow, thank you, Doctor. I'll assess this on my computer. <clears throat> Species number one, Strix nebulosa, commonly known as the Great Grey Owl. Its diet consists of rodents, snakes, and birds. Their appearance is a silvery gray pattern with great white and brown streaks with a faint bearing. Their yellow eyes can be seen with two pale arcs forming an X between their eyes. Across the necks, it's a white bow tie marking with a black center. Their bill, if visible, is yellow. There is not a lot of variance between the appearance of the males and females. The owl is nocturnal, so it conducts its hunting at night with a cautious style to benefit its own survival. The predators of the great gray owl are the great horned owl, small carnivores, and black bears. Species number two, Ursus americanus, commonly known as the black bear. The black bear is a medium-sized bear with a large range of weight for the males ranging from 160 to 660 pounds, whereas the females typically weigh around 180 pounds. The black bear is a thriving species that has a population size that is growing substantially. Its diet consists of berries, fish, mammals, vegetation, insects, and human food and garbage. The black bear appearance is mostly uniform since they have mostly all black fur with the exception of their sometimes being light markings on their chest and a brown muzzle. They are adaptable and typically lone gatherers that dire to their large size have no predators. Species number three, Bubo scandiacus, commonly known as the snowy owl. It is a medium-sized owl that is white in color and feasts on various rodents and smaller birds. Unlike most owls, the snowy owl is not nocturnal and hunts during the day. The predators of this animal consist of foxes and larger birds. Another thing to note is that the snowy owl has little to no pigment or blood in its feathers, which makes the color white. Thank you, William. That was very helpful. We will be heading back to the forest, where we can see if we can collect more information. Good. You guys be safe out there now. Today you have learned of multiple species who inhabit the deciduous forest, a quite magnificent and beautiful biome. I will now take you on a tour through the forest to reveal a few more species. This first species is a honeybee. A herbivore who helps the forest in pollinating multiple plants and is a species who partakes in mutualism. This is a process where it pollinates plants and flowers, such as the British yellow flower. Due to pollination, the plant receives growth support while the bee receives nectar. Therefore, the bee can produce honey. They are one of the most well-known examples of mutualism, and the honey bee is a great benefactor to the biome and helps to support plants and pollination while also feeding animals with its delicious honey. A plant I just mentioned was the British yellow flower, an invasive species within the biome. The British yellow flower was brought over from Europe during the colonization of America, and its physical attributes resemble the look of a dandelion. The only difference is their petal shape. For the British yellow flower has a rounder petal and possesses four to six large low petals. Now here to explain the counterpart are our naturalists explaining a parasite and its host. Today we'll be talking about the deer tick and its host, the Northwestern moose. Yes, thank you for bringing me into this conversation. The Northwestern moose is a heterotroph that possesses broad large antlers on the men and the females have no antlers at all. They're the largest member of the deer family, and there are several behavioral traits that are specific to them, such as the men will all fight together for their mate, and they will also travel together in a herd 
led by the alpha. Mm. They're usually a solitary species, but when provoked, they get aggravated very easily. But not by the deer tick. Thank you, Micah, for explaining the great host of the deer tick. The deer tick is personally a favorite of mine because I personally relate to it. The deer tick is a parasite who bites deer and other species such as mice. Physically, they have hard bodies and small black legs. The ticks feed off the blood of other species and give nothing back in return. And like the counterpart, the tick and deer are one of the best known parasites and hosts. Another host commonly found in the deciduous forest is once again belonging to the deer family, the roe deer. This creature is a short furred deer who has a herbivorous diet. Slender in appearance, it is not very large in comparison to most deer, like the moose. It also has relatively small antlers, no tail, and the fur color changes during seasons, whether being reddish in the summer and gray in the winter. Very cool. Hey, while you guys are all together, could you tell us about a few more animals? Yes, we definitely can. What animals what can animal? we talk about? Oh, of course, the long-tailed weasel. Oh, yes. A long-tailed weasel, a carnivore with long whiskers, a long lengthy body, and a long neck as well. And strangely enough, its legs are short and not long. Very long. Don't forget though, they also have camouflage. Whoa! Oh, correct. The long-tailed weasel's camouflage protects itself from predators when helping when hunting. The weasel will hunt small games, such as mice, voles, rabbits, and more. The long-tailed weasel also has a very high metabolism rate allowing it to eat about 40% of its body weight. Do you guys want to tell the viewers about one more species before they go? Why, of course. What about the Choho Salmon? Coho Salmon. Coho? Choho? Choho, Coho Salmon. Let's really keep going. Choho. <laughs> oh. All right. Once again, I'll talk about its size and description. Spanning the length of 58 inches and weighing as much as 126 pounds, the coho salmon looks like your regular salmon, but its colors will differ depending on its location. Archer, do you want to explain this one and Micah the other? Well, this one is when the salmon is in fresh water and at the spawn, returning there during the beginning and the end of its life. It will have more colorful scales possessing a red and green color. The red being on the belly and the green being everywhere else. The counterpart of this form takes during the rest of its life to form out in the ocean. It will take a grayish color and look like the average saltwater salmon. Whereas the spawn color will look more like the Bass Pro Shop logo fish. Some of the viewers may know the life cycle in the salmon from our previous episode. And that life cycle is a very key part to this biome. When the salmon is fully grown, it comes back to the spawn to pass away and lay its eggs. It will bring back nutrients from the ocean that will help the newborns and the wildlife of the forest. Their past bodies are also eaten by many creatures too. Okay, let's let the viewers go back to the learning of other animals. Today you've learned all about the deciduous forest and what type of biome it is, as well as the many species existing in the biome. The deciduous forest is a very beautiful biome, but it's susceptible to harming impacts such as human overlogging, destroying the habitat of many creatures with reduction of the amount of habitats the animal can use, leading to their deaths. Also with smaller populations, if there is a bad winter, then a whole group of animals could be killed and unable to reproduce if they can't find enough food or freeze ending the population. As logging occurs, it reduces the amount of available habitat for first animals, which means that populations will get smaller, and smaller populations are more vulnerable to environmental changes and pressures. One bad cold winter could wipe out a population of deer if they can't find enough food to survive. Humans also pose a threat to climate change upon this biome. The climate change threats such as wildfires, storms, insect outbreaks, and the occurrence of invasive species in the forest, they can also make winters warmer, which can help trees killing bugs survive. Also, climate change is causing dry regions to get drier and wet areas to turn wetter, which increases the rate of storms or ice storms. 
help protect the deciduous forest from deforestation and donate to the Nature Conservancy. Thank you for joining us today on our walk through the deciduous forest. As always, I'm your host, and join us next time when we take a look at the polar ice caps.